Hello, hello. Oh, it's so nice. Wonderful to see all of you. Wow. Hmm. Don't forget to take a look around. You know, for just a reminder, some of the folks um, who are here for the Sunday sit, you're joining the um, kind of closing talk of our weekend retreat for a period of a month long practice of um, the four foundations of mindfulness. And we're just finishing up the weekend on Chitta Nupassana, of observation of the mind. And we've got folks here who've been sitting all weekend, some who've been sitting for 10 days, some for more than two weeks now, and some who will keep on for another couple of weeks. And so it's a nice bunch of rhythms of practice going on at the same time. Mm. We've been laying out the map of the four foundations in a way that sort of by default comes across um, sequentially or seemingly progressively. However, um, as we talked about over the weekend, these, these four foundations or domains, establishments, they are our moment to moment experience. Body, feelings, mind, or consciousness, and all other dhammas or nature, all the nature that we experience moment to moment. Everything is momentary, instantaneous. Still, we spread it out so we understand the map, internalize the map, uh, close our eyes or not, and then essentially establish ourselves in the present moment. And then experience reveals its own nature to the inner awareness, inner knowing mind. The, the Buddha called this our ancestral home. Use the example of a, of a birth story or Jataka tale of this sparrow who wandered outside its own pasture into uh, the briars, the papancha briars, mental proliferation briars. And once he, once, once the sparrow stepped outside of the boundaries of its own land, uh, a hawk swept down, picked it up and took it up to its perch on a cliff to eat it for lunch. But the sparrow said, you would not have been able to catch me on my own land. You're only able to catch me because I was, I was in the briars. And so, in that way, this, the sparrow sort of tricked the hawk um, by its own pride, the pride of the hawk, challenging it to try and catch it in its own land. So the hawk swept back down, dropped the sparrow in the, in the widest expanse of the land, like an open field instead of by rocks or trees and then flew up flew up to the clouds and then kind of jet stream down toward the sparrow which is just a speck in that open field 
But for the sparrow who knew every centimeter of its land, it knew just to take one step back and it would drop into a small hole and disappear, which it did at the very last minute. And the, the hawk came crashing down upon itself till it was just a pile of feathers and its claws and its beak. And the sparrow climbed out of the hole and on top of the, the hawk and um, just imagine it crossed its feathers and said, you see, I'm on my ancestral land. I am home. And in my own home, I am safe. It is a refuge. I cannot be harmed in my ancestral land, my ancestral home. And the, the Buddha referring to that that birth story said, in the same way, in the same way, meditators, bhikkhus, the four domains or establishments of mindfulness are our own home, our ancestral home. If we know the body as the body, feelings as feelings, the mind as mind, and the dhammas are nature, as nature, we cannot be harmed. We've taken refuge in the dhamma, in the present moment, and we will be protected. So we began with emphasis on, on the body, elemental nature of the body, um, postures, sitting, standing, lying, walking, movement between the postures, every single daily activity, everything that we do, preparing food and using the bathroom and bathing and dressing, undressing, going to sleep, following the breath until you fall asleep, waking up, picking up the breath, noticing sight and sound and so forth all throughout the day. And then from postures and activities, uh, a little more refined awareness to feel the body within the body, that is elemental nature of body, uh, traditionally called earth, water, fire, air for the experienced manifestation of body in textures, hard and soft, cohesion and fluidity, heat, coolness, pressure, oscillation, movement, vibration. A full analysis of the four elements uh, actually go into sound and sight and odor and space. So from the very, from the four uh, essential elements of fire, water, earth, water, fire, air, goes into 28 more in the Buddhist psychology. So in that way, we, we're, we're peeking into the universe. If we know our own body, if we know, know, know the natures expressed in our own body, we, begin to understand the physical element nature of the universe itself. Which is largely a mystery, <laughs> but we get little peaks nevertheless. Uh, I was visiting Michelle and Jesse last month on the Big Island and we walked to the end of the road at night uh, when there's no moon and see the Milky Way above Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, the largest and the tallest mountain in the world from its base underwater. And it's, it's really literally mystifying 
to, to look at, at the thicket of stars uh, above Sagittarius in, in the sort of central part of our Milky Way home galaxy. But, but I was noticing these dark areas and I, I, went, I went back to where I was staying and, and looked up what's called the Great Rift. And the Great Rift are indeed these dark swaths uh, going down parts of the Milky Way. And some of the ancient cultures like the Incas and Cusco, and Peru, they would see constellations in the dark areas. For example, uh, Lama is one of their constellations. And it's in this area that's just dark. They, they were able to make a constellation out of the darkness. And it came to life as an important myth in their culture. So the next time when there's no moon and you have clear skies, just see if you can notice this, this um, dark drift or swath of darkness in the light of the Milky Way and practice focusing just on those dark areas. In meditation, sometimes it's like that when we are looking, for example, at the body, our feelings, or the mind as we've been doing this weekend especially. And rather than just looking for predominant mind states or predominant sensations, if we're looking at the body, it's as if we're lo looking in between the pronounced or stronger sensations or more pronounced mental states to the subtler ones, the subtler mind moments, mental qualities that arise, our feeling tones, as we were talking last weekend about uh, the challenge of looking at neutral feeling tone, because obviously a pleasant feeling tone or a painful feeling tone, much more pronounced and, and generally our awareness goes to that more pronounced pleasant or unpleasant feeling tone. It requires more of a relaxation, more of a ease of being and soft gaze of the mind's eye of awareness to attune to that which is neither pleasant or unpleasant. It takes some patience, it's like looking at the dark rift of, of the sky to attune to, to, to the darkness until we may actually see imagery, imagery that in our ancient cultures brought out a whole mythological set of stories and myths, myths to live by. When we started this weekend uh, on Friday, we started with the refuges and precepts as most of you are familiar with. It's an important ritual. We, we are indeed going for refuge in this Dhamma. Um, And to go to the refuge, often we have to go through some difficult initial challenges, resistance, um, posture pain, other body pain, chronic pain, old pains, new pains, uh, and emotional resistance, emotional difficult emotions are very pleasant ones that we grow attached to. And, they all become a challenge in one way or another. You know, it's not like we find a neutral ground and then just coast from there. There's always something uh, that we're up against, um, a resistance without which 
we can't really grow, like the sprout pushing through the, the earth in order to reach light. Uh, so to understand that, you know, finding even little areas of refuge in our emotional landscape or in our physical bodily landscape is of great value. When we're dealing with a lot of knee pain, for example, um, yes, it's helpful to, to see it face to face, to bring our awareness and notice particular sensations of, of pins and needles or, or pressure, tightness, clenching, and so forth, as well as notice the feeling tone of unpleasantness before it goes into reactiveness, aversion, ill will, uh, very strong resistance. Uh, so within that, within that dance of, of touching, feeling, noticing the sensations, noticing the feeling tone, noticing the mind that is observing it, uh, the mind states, are they calm or are they anxious? Is there some equanimity there to help keep the mindfulness pure? Or is the equanimity um, uh, a little undernourished so that mindfulness is bouncing around and so forth? And so sometimes we, we need to just put our awareness somewhere else, another part of the body that does feel safe, neutral, or if we're dealing with emotions, uh, that particularly difficult, painful emotion of hurt or grief, sadness, sorrow, anger, um, and so forth. It's tiring to be with any kind of pain for too long. In Buddhist psychology, uh, pain, whether physical or mental, withers the mind and drains the energy. So then it's helpful to go to other emotions or other mental states that aren't so taxing to the system. So then we try that. That's why we have the Brahma Viharas. When things are diff difficult, either physically or mentally, we use our, our chitta mind, our chitta nupasana, the seeing clearly of the mind to, to call up one of these qualities that we have been cultivating, loving kindness, caring compassion, empathetic joy or equanimity. And because they've been practiced, they may come out maybe three times out of five, uh, but that's enough that we can call up compassion. It's always a pleasant mind state. Uh, if it's not, then it's not compassion, pure, wise compassion is always pleasant because it feels good to care. And so that pleasant, caring mental state cultivated through our chitta nupasana is a refuge. It's a safe place to anchor, to feel that we're in our ancestral home until we have the energy and strength and interest to again attend to the difficult mental states um, that we've been working with. So we don't have to make a project and stay with the mental states, the difficult or challenging ones until they go away. They won't. They'll come back or other forms of them will come back. And similarly with the body, the, the, the hands, the feet, those places where we can find some neutral ground, some refuge. So we're not taxing our strength by just continually being with that aching back or neck strain and pain. But to think of, um, of all of these gateways, all of these domains, the pasture of sensations of the constitute what we call body and vedana or feelings 
that constitute the moment to moment uh, affect of experience in terms of pleasant or unpleasant, um, happy or painful mind states and sensations. Um, how to work with them in, in, when they arise and how all these four establishments it can be a refuge that we, we count on. If we explore enough of the body and we explore enough of feeling tones and enough of the mental states and consciousness itself, we, we will find refuge. Maybe not the same one every time, but there, there'll be a, a few places that we go to. E even if there's something we imagine as part of Chitta Vipassana, uh, a, a safe place, a beach, a waterfall, a forest, and to hold that as a meditative object in the mind to reestablish a stability, a centeredness, a, a place of interior safety till we can move forward. Um, when Michelle and Jesse were visiting my island here a couple of months ago, um, Michelle wanted me to take her to see my elementary school, the place I went to school up to the sixth grade. Uh, and it was, um, I was always curious why she liked even the name of the school. It's called Epiphany Day School. It's an Episcopalian school. Maybe because Episcopalians are the closest to Catholicism. I wasn't a Catholic, I wasn't an Episcopalian, but I, I know that Michelle had fun, so to speak, with her, her uh, career in Catholicism, um, eventually being excommunicated for asking a question. I didn't have that challenge. I had Father Lynn Scott. He was the head of Epiphany Day School. And what I actually learned from him in the fourth grade was um, Chitta Nupasana and Kaya Nupasana. He'd have us for a period of time, 45 minutes every day, lie on our dark denim um, sleeping mats and they were like sleeping bags if we want we could tuck ourselves in or just lay on top of it and then we'd start with our toes and we would tighten our toes and relax them tighten our feet and then relax them tighten our ankles our calves or thighs or our hips our bellies our chest our hands lower arms upper arms neck and head all the way through the body, tighten, relax, tighten, relax. Very similar to, of course, the, the Kaya Nupasana awareness and seeing clearly bodily nature, textures and temperatures, vibrations and pressures. And Chitta Nupasana in, in the relaxation, noticing the relaxation. He, did, he didn't call it a meditation. If he did, I don't remember. Or I may not have even known what it meant. It was just we had to do it. And everyone did what Father Linscott said because he was the head of the school. He, he ran it. And uh, I was also an uh, altar boy. I had to carry the incense, light the candles and put them out. Uh, and. So the school is next to this ancient church, going way back to the early 1900s, at least. So we walked by the school, Michelle and I, a couple of months ago, and there was this red door. I, re I remember it, having to go enter into it uh, as a fourth and fifth and sixth grader. And Michelle knew about the red door. So the red door is like in Ho Now Now on the Big Island. The Pu'u Honua. Pu'u Honua means a place of refuge. And Ho Now Now 
there's a place named a bay in south of Kona on the big island. Uh, and the Puuhonu Oho now, now I've known all my life that as if anyone ever made it there during times of war, they were safe. Their enemies couldn't touch them. They couldn't cross the line. They couldn't go into Oh Now Now. And as long as the person, uh, the refugee or the escapee stayed there, no harm would come to them. And Michelle said that it's the same meaning that anyone in the Middle Ages in England, when this red door business began, if you made it into the red door, your, the oppressors could not come in no matter what. And, and, and here, uh, spiritual law was stronger than civil law. So no matter what, and what magistrate or what law, uh, what orders were given, no one could come in there and get anyone there who was a refugee from harm. Once in that red door, safe. And I like these images. I like them because um, it's similar to our ancestral home of the body. It's also similar to the dark rift, the dark part of the Milky Way. Because even though the stars are hidden by th this gaseous, cloudy, vaporous darkness, What's happening is new stars are being formed. Stars are being born in this, in this dark womb called the Great Rift. And so out of the darkness comes this new life, new stars, new solar systems, new galaxies. Um, so it's, it too is kind of is a refuge where there's a holding period for the gases to form into life, planetary potential for the future. And when we go into our safe place, whether it's a red door or a city of refuge or into the Dhamma understanding of the body within the body and the feelings within the feelings and chitta consciousness within consciousness are nature within nature, the dhammas that constitute all of our six sense door experience, for example, are the qualities that we need to suspend for there to be calm and insight and the qualities that we need to cultivate for there to be awakening. The first being the hindrances, the latter being the awakening factors. It's like they all form under protection. They all form in a, a place of refuge, in the, in the great rift, in the sanctity of the red door or the city of refuge or in, in the heart of consciousness when we're anchored in the Dhamma in knowing consciousness as consciousness. Are anchored in the body, knowing the body as the body. If we know in this way, we're not cultivating attachment to the body or to pleasant mental states. We're not cultivating aversion to what hurts in the body or in the emotionally challenging, uh, difficult states. We're just knowing it as it is. It, whether it's pleasant or painful or neutral doesn't matter. We're just knowing the truth. And, and that's where Dhamma is refuge. Dhamma is a meaning of Dhamma is truth. And if we take refuge in truth, we will know truth. And, and truth is safe. It's a refuge and it's liberating. We, we use our awareness and exploration of chitta to help shape chitta, to help shape the mindset, our consciousness. And we shape it with, with mindfulness itself. We shape it by understanding and abandoning the five hindrances, sense desire, 
sleepiness, aversion, anxiety, doubt. We shape it by cultivating awakening factors of mindfulness, investigation of nature, energy, uh, joyousness from the Dhamma, calm, concentration, equanimity. We're shaping our consciousness every moment that we're aware because all those awakening qualities arise out of a moment of mindful awareness. And in a moment of mindful awareness, the hindrances cannot intrude. They can't invade. We've created a shelter. We've created a protective cocoon, what is called weweka. Weweka uh, is, means like a, like a place of refuge, really. Um, but it's that exterior safe place uh, when we are on retreat and uh, everyone's under the noble silence so nobody's talking. So external hindrances can't intrude. And then we, we create an internally safe place, this shelter, this we wake up um, where sense desire may arise, but it tends to fall away like water off of a, a lotus leaf. Aversion, surely it will arise, but in moments where we're really mindful, are we are equanimous, or we call up a Brahma Vihara of compassion and so forth, it can't stick. The aversion, the ill will, uh, the difficult near and far enemies of the Brahma Viharas, they just slide away. And so that uh, we wake up provides a, a kind of, not just a refuge, but a kind of happiness. The mind feels happy when the hindrances, hindrances are not intruding. And then we have the energy and mindful awareness to do deeper work, to cultivate more concentration and actually nurture the awakening factors that I mentioned, the energizing ones and the calming ones. And so it's another kind of happiness, the happiness we get from, from we wake up and, and the rest from feeling that protection from hindrances externally, internally, the, the deepest kind of rest. In fact, we wake up is a synonym for Nibbana, the, the most profound relaxation or rest is Nibbana. Well, a moment of we wake up is just like that. And then the happiness from having a concentrated mind where we're further shaping and developing our, our chitta with mindfulness and the awakening factors or with the Brahma Viharas, we're, we're establishing these mindsets that will follow us around throughout the day, throughout our conversations. And they, because chitta is so uh, intertwined and interdependent on volition, uh, Chaitana, another mental, very important set of mental states, um, volition or intention is behind every thought that we think, we're behind our thinking patterns, negative or positive. And volition, Chaitana is behind our speech patterns and habits, negative or positive, and it's behind our physical actions and patterns, skillful or unskillful. So we're shaping our, our chitta with every mindful moment, with every metta movement, with every uh, murita, empathetic, joyful moment, we condition the chitta and then we apply it to our our, th our thoughts to overcome negative thinking and promote uh, more positive uplifting thinking forms and our speech to improve our speech, listen better, speak with 
more intention to communicate rather than to talk at someone or over someone. Uh, to engage others by attuning to their goodness from our own goodness. All the ways we cultivate chitta, we're, we're cultivating our entire body-mind system. And we're creating this incredibly safe ancestral home through understanding the body is the body and feelings is feelings and consciousness and all its mindsets, all its component parts as, as consciousness and, and, and picking out those aspects of it that we want to develop, awakening factors, mindfulness, Brahma Viharas and so forth. And then understanding the dhammas, the natures, um, the hindrances, the awakening factors, but also when we're seeing, to know that seeing is happening without the seer, without getting caught between the seer and the object of the sight, because that's where identification arises. That's where attachment arises. That's where our personal narrative and story that further solidifies a sense of a solid separate self. So to know seeing as seeing and dropping the sense of there being a seer, a hearer, a thinker, and just the awareness of seeing, hearing, thinking as it is, is a refuge, is an ancestral home and stability, is an incredibly beautiful place, whether it's the dark drift are the lightness of the Milky Way. I'd like to read a, a poem by John Rodell. I think it's a poetic um, description of our ancestral home. See what you think. Be patient. It's a little bit long. In fact, the talk might be over. It's called My Brain and Heart Divorced. My brain and heart divorced a decade ago over who was to blame about how big of a mess I have become. Eventually, they couldn't be in the same room with each other. Now my head and heart share custody of me. I stay with my brain during the week and my heart gets me on weekends. They never speak to one another. Instead, they give me some note to pass to each other every week. And their notes, they send to one another, always says the same thing. This is all your fault. <laughs> On Sundays, my heart complains about how my head has let me down in the past. And on Wednesdays, my head lists all the times my heart has screwed things up for me in the future. They blame each other for the state of my life. There's been a lot of yelling and crying. So lately, I've been spending a lot of time with my gut, who serves as my unofficial therapist. Most nights, I sneak out of the window of my rib cage and slide down my spine and collapse on my gut's plush leather chair that's always open for me. And I just sit, sit, sit until the sun comes up. Last evening, my gut asked me if I was having a hard time being caught between my heart, my heart and my head. I nodded. I said, I didn't know if I could live with either of them anymore. 
my heart is always sad about something that happened yesterday, while my head is always worried about something that may happen tomorrow, I lamented. And my gut squeezed my hand. I just can't live with my mistakes of the past or my anxiety about the future, I sighed. My gut smiled and said, in that case, you should go stay with your lungs for a while. I was confused. The look on my face gave it away. If you are exhausted about your heart, heart's obsession or with the fixed past and your mind's focus on the uncertain future, your lungs are the perfect place for you. There is no yesterday in your lungs. There is no tomorrow either. There is only now. There is only inhale. There is only exhale. There is only this moment. There is only breath. And in that breath, you can rest while your heart and head work their relationship out. This morning, while my brain was busy reading tea leaves, and while my heart was staring at old photographs, I packed a little bag and walked to the door of my lungs. Before I could even knock, she opened the door with a smile. And as a gust of air embraced me, she said, what took you so long? So as we breathe for a few minutes here at the end, to think on these things, on our ancestral home, our bodies, our feelings, our chitta, probably the best word for mind, consciousness, mental states, and on, on nature, a good translation for how dhammas is used as the fourth domain or fourth establishment of mindfulness. Then we know our ancestral home. In order to be mindful, there has to be something to be mindful of. As Upandita often said, mindfulness can only be aware of, of things that are real what things are real, direct felt sense experience, things that we touch, textures, things that we see, light, that we hear, sound vibration, uh, that we think about, thought formations, mental states, emotions, fragrances that we inhale, flavors, that we digest and taste. It's our ancestral home, it's our refuge. It, it's our um, pu'uhonua, place of refuge. It's our red door going into which no harm is allowed to follow. It's then our awareness, our Brahma Viharas stand guard for us. In, in Burma at the, at the monasteries, the very oldest, some of them one or 2,000 years old, in the area where we, we teach every January for the last 24 years, except for this year, there are these mythical creatures called chinta. They kind of look like lions. Um, and uh, so their mouths are open and there's this fierceness, but they're kind of round shaped. You can also feel that they're, they're gentle creatures, but that they're, they're for you. They're for you, meaning they will protect you. They have your back. And in fact, that's exactly how they're positioned for they're facing out from the temple. 
and behind their backs is the domain of Dhamma, is the inner sanctuary of the temple or the Dhamma hall where the Buddha is. So the Chinta's, Chinta's fierceness is keeping at bay any intrusion, any harm, any assault, the allurements, temptations, the intimidations, and so forth. And the, word, the most insidious of all, any assault on our worthiness, anything that's saying, who are we? What right do we have to sit on the seat of awakening? Do we deserve it? Are we worthy? And when Siddhartha was challenged by Mara, the personification of greed, hatred, delusion, the night of his enlightenment, and said, why, you, why do you deserve to be there and not me? I've done a lot of good things. I'm a very compassionate person. I have witnesses. Who are your witnesses to your goodness? And the Buddha's response, the Buddha to be, Siddhartha's response was to touch the earth, Mother Earth herself. She's witness to my goodness, to my worthiness, that I deserve to be awakened. Let's sit for a moment, feel the body, feel the feelings, feel chitta consciousness, feel all your other natures, seeing, hearing. knowing, things as they are. I've lost my bell, so one of my colleagues will have to save me so I don't have to go outside of the red door. Nice to have all of you who sit with us on Sundays. And those of you who have been with us for the weekends or the month retreat. Now, when you get up to practice, see how the mind inclines. toward body, feelings, consciousness, sense phenomena, and walk with that as your meditation. Or just breathe. Thank you, Stephen and um... Just a reminder, those of you at the retreat will have the uh, last sit, the metta chant, the metta choir, metta chant sit at 3.30 Hawaii time. And uh, yeah, lovely to see everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for your practice. Mm.